Welcome to worship for the week of February 27th, 2022. I am the Reverend Mary Kay Schooneman, the senior pastor at Portage United Church of Christ in Portage, Michigan. And I am delighted to have you joining us for our online worship this week. This week, it turns out, is the last week of our worship series called Discipleship by the Sea. And today, we hear the word feed as part of our call to discipleship. It was Jesus' command to Peter as they sat by the seaside having a breakfast of grilled fish. And it is also the call to us who live as disciples in the 21st century. Feed my sheep. Jesus says. Now we often think of coming to church so that we can be fed and feel supplied for the week ahead. And while nourishing our soul is an important requirement for a faithful life of discipleship, the call to actually living as a disciple is to feed Jesus's sheep, to tend to Jesus' sheep. So let's think about that position that of the two ideas about being fed and feeding Jesus' sheep. How do they work together? How to, do they balance each other? Are they in balance in our lives? Or are they out of balance? As we prepare to enter this time of worship and hold this question in our hearts, I ask you to please also hold in your hearts and lift up into the light of God's grace the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia as their war erupts. Let us pray that the peace of God will prevail and this will be quickly resolved without weapons and destruction. We know that God's way is a way of life and love and grace and mercy. Let us pray that those sheep of God's 
in Ukraine and in Russia will be held in that light and that mercy, will be tended to by that light and that mercy, and know the peace of God's love, and have their lives transformed away from war and destruction. So let us rest in God's presence, knowing that God's presence is not only with you wherever you are, but also surrounding those people in conflict right now. And let us prepare our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our spirits for worship. The promised encounter with the resurrected Christ on the shore of the Sea of Galilee is told in the Gospel of John. Jesus, unrecognized at first by the disciples, instructs them not to give up in casting their nets. They will be all right. As usual, a meal is the setting for the reunion, a fitting context for the commission to go and feed God's people out of our love for Jesus. And so our meal, communion, this day, will be the culmination of our series with the ritual of commissioning of disciples, all of us, to go and do likewise in the world. Please pray with me. Flawed and foolish as we are, O oh Jesus, you call us to lay aside all that entangles us and follow you into service to others. You invite us to step into the waters of life and hope, reaching out to draw others to our side so that together we might enter your kingdom of laughter and joy. May we hear again those simple words, come follow me, and remember the depth of your grace and your love for us. Amen. Community of Christ, who make the cross your own, live out your creed and risk your life for God alone, the God who wears your face, to whom all worlds belong, whose children are of every race and every song. Community of Christ, look past the church's door and see the refugee, the hungry and the poor. Take hands with the oppressed, 
the jobless in your street. Take towel and water that you wash your neighbor's feet. When head is melts away, so shall God's will be done. The climate of the world be and Christ its Son. Our courage be love and kindly as our law. Our food and faith be shared as one Today's Gospel lesson is from the 21st chapter of John, where we read these words. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Simon Peter said to the others, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. And so they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Church pictorial directories show pastors doing pastoral things in the pulpit, surrounded by children for a children's message, teaching Sunday school or deep in thought in the inner sanctum of the pastor's study. But if you look at the pictorial directories of the churches I've served, you will see many pictures of me holding a plate at the potluck table or striking various poses while in the act of eating. You see, I love food. I love everything about food. I love to plant it and pick it and catch it and clean it and prep it and cook it and serve it up with a touch of glass. I love to feed people. Now, you guess you could say I'm a foodie. Well, my wife doesn't call me that. She says I am a food snob. And if that's what she wants to call someone who refuses to eat at fast food chains, except, mind you, for Culver's, and who interrogate, interrogates the server at 
restaurants about the entree, then so be it. The Bible is filled with images of food, of hungering and thirsting, of harvesting and feasting. There are so many references to food in Scripture that someone said that food is God's love made edible. And whether you eat from a food truck or a Michelin star restaurant, food is a gift. And when we forget that everything necessary for our existence is a gift from God, then the train goes off the rails. We eat too much, we eat too little, and we try to nourish ourselves with things that cannot sustain us. You know, someone observed that in the Gospels, most of the time Jesus is either going to, at, or coming from a meal. We know that his critics said there was too much eating and drinking going on. They called Jesus a drunkard and a glutton. Apparently, he enjoyed breaking bread in the wrong places with the wrong people. Because, you see, with Jesus, meals were theological statements. They were demonstrations of God's grace that blew apart people's narrow notions about who was acceptable and who was not. Now John's Gospel tells us that even though Jesus had appeared to the disciples twice after the resurrection, they were still lost in the fog, still clueless about what to do next which is reflected in Peter's comment, I'm going fishing. And six of the disciples tagged along with him. They fished all night, and you know the story, they got skunked. And some wise guy up on the beach said, you haven't caught anything, now have you? And they said, no. Well, then put down your nets on the starboard side, he said, and they did. And there were so many fish bulging that net that they had to drag it ashore. And then it dawned on them that it was Jesus. He had a fire going and some fish on the far fire ready to go. Breakfast was served. Now, going back just a few days before, Jesus fed them supper, bread and wine, body and blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And now by the sea, John says that Jesus took bread and gave it to the disciples and then the fish. You know, this too is the language of the Eucharist edible love that fed their stomachs, but also fed their small minds and their shriveled spirits. Sarah Miles was the most unlikely candidate for conversion that you could imagine. Her maternal and paternal grandparents were overseas missionaries, and yet her parents became atheists, and that is how she was raised. Sarah was a cultured critic of religion, a skeptical intellectual, a journalist, and she just so happened to be a professional chef. At age 46, she tagged along with a friend to an Episcopal church worship in San Francisco, where she got in line to receive the Eucharist. She took the piece of bread and took the sip of wine from the cup, and she had a mystical experience. She said the bread wasn't a symbolic wafer, the bread was the bread of life. 
She said that she couldn't really explain it, but she said it was like I was eating Jesus and I had this burning desire to belong to his body. And I knew what I needed to do for the rest of my life. In that moment, I knew that I had to feed people. What began as a simple act of communion grew to become a food pantry in that Episcopal church that gave food to poor people as an act of communion. And they distributed the food from around the very table where Sarah first met Jesus. And Sarah Miles, over the years, has overseen the distribution of hundreds of tons of food to thousands of people, and she has helped establish model pantries all over the country. And Sarah Miles said this, the prerequisite to conversion is not having a religious vocabulary, it is not knowing how to behave in church. It is not even having a prior set of beliefs. The prerequisite is hunger and knowing where to find bread. Jesus told Peter to bring some of the fish that they had caught. Even though there were already fish on the fire, he told Peter to bring some more fish. Because you see, Jesus had the habit of asking the disciples to contribute the little bit which they had to what he had provided. You may remember from the gospel lesson last week that the disciples brought Jesus two fish and five loaves of bread, and with it he fed 5,000 people. I heard someone tell a story from his childhood that taught him a lesson of how God turns scarcity into abundance. Robert was the only one in his family who went to church. And the pastor reminded everyone about the picnic in the community park the next Sunday. He said, everyone bring a dish and we'll have a great time. Well, the next Sunday as church dismissed, someone asked Robert, you're coming to the picnic now, aren't you? Well, he forgot. And so he ran home and all he could find in the refrigerator was a dried up piece of bologna, some stale bread, and the last bit of mustard in the bottom of a jar. And so he slapped the sandwich together, stuffed it in a paper bag, and raced to the park. And when he arrived, he saw the tables filled with wonderful food and desserts. And he was so embarrassed by his paltry little offering that he sat at a table by himself. And then an inviting voice said, come sit with us, Robert. Uh, no, thank you, he said. I'll just sit here and eat my sandwich. Uh, we'd love to have you join us, Robert. Look, we've got fried chicken and baked beans and potato salad and deviled eggs and I made a peach pie. Shoot, we even have homemade vanilla ice cream. Oh no, Robert said, I, I, I sh couldn't do that. Sure you can, the woman said. And besides, we just love bologna sandwiches. And Robert said that in that moment, the veil was parted just a little bit and he caught a glimpse of the kingdom of God where we come as paupers and end up feasting like royalty. You know, we often feel the, the offerings we have are so paltry in the face of the world's great and deep need. But Jesus 
continues to invite us to bring what we have and join it what, with what he provides. He said, don't despise what you've got. Bring me your fish. Bring me your bologna sandwich. Bring me your care and your compassion and watch the blessings flow. Have you ever noticed in your reading of the Gospels that the miracle Jesus performs before Easter are more impressive than what he does after Easter? Now, in our text, Jesus is on an isolated beach, tending a fire, cooking fish, and asked the fishermen if they had any luck. Nothing impressive here, except John is telling us something very important about where we find Jesus. We may think that the best place to meet Jesus is in sacred spaces, surrounded by stained glass in moments of high worship that make us feel that surely the Lord is in this place. And certainly that is one place and one way that we meet Jesus. But John puts the resurrected Lord right in the middle of ordinary life. He's in the kitchen, frying up seven orders of cod and hush puppies. And after they had eaten, he's having a intimate personal word with Peter. Three times, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Now, we usually interpret that passage as kind of a questioning of interrogation. Jesus making Peter sweat because he denied knowing him three times. But this isn't how Jesus operates. You notice he didn't scold Peter. He didn't guilt trip him into a confession. Nothing is sad about forgiveness because Jesus simply wanted Peter to remember who he was and what he was to do. In the 18th chapter of John, Jesus was arrested and, and interrogated. And he tells us that outside the gate, a woman said to Peter, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? And Peter said, not me. No, I am not. Peter needed to now accept what Jesus needed him to be. The rock upon which the church was built, the keeper of the keys to the kingdom was being given a promotion. If you love me, Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, because you have been promoted to a shepherd. You are a keeper, a keeper of the flock now. And Peter couldn't believe that Jesus would turn over the ministry of feeding the flock to him. I was fortunate to be raised in a family of good cooks. My aunt ran a catering service and her daughter, Linda, like her mother, is a fine cook. Now, Linda also has a Master's of Divinity degree from the seminary where Mary Kay received her MDiv. Linda is the outreach director of a United Methodist congregation in Ohio. And Linda is a woman who just beams with the love of Jesus Christ. She loves to feed bodies and she loves to feed souls. And her church provides meals for 250 people each month. 
Greeters welcome guests at the door. They are not given a tray and told to stand in line. No, they are escorted to their tables by a host. And the server comes around and hands them a menu. And everyone is not eating the same thing. They give them menus and take their drink orders. And the food is not served on paper plates and eaten with plastic utensils. No, they bring out real plates and silverware. The tables are covered with tablecloths and accented with flowers and candles. Now the people who come to the church cannot afford to take their families to restaurants. They are hungering for food to be sure, but they also hunger for dignity. They hunger to know that people care. And because the disciples at the Prospect Street United Methodist Church love Jesus, that is what these people receive. Peter the Rock was now Peter the Shepherd. If you love me, Peter, be who I need you to be. Feed my flock. Now you may say there's nothing particularly glamorous or spectacular about that, and you're right. There's no need for credentials or degrees, and certainly sainthood isn't a prerequisite. Sarah Miles said that a simple act of communion pointed her to Jesus' radically inclusive love that accompanies people in the most ordinary moments of life, eating and drinking and fellowshipping in fear, in death and beyond. Because see, my fellow disciples, it's all about the great importance of little deeds. If we love him, we will care for those who need cared for. We will value them. We will feed their hunger in body and soul. And we will see them as Jesus did, not with suspicion or defensiveness, but we will see them as sheep without a shepherd in need of compassion. Uh, I don't like the way I did that one. I'm sorry, but this will be the last revision, Madeline. One, two, three. You see, it's all about the great importance of little deeds. If we love him, we will care for those who need cared for. We will value them. We will feed their hunger in body and soul, and we will see them as Jesus did, not with suspicion and defensiveness, but as sheep without a shepherd, as people in need of compassion. Amen. Because you made the world and intended it to be a good place and called its people your children. Because when things seemed at their worst, you came in Christ to bring out the best in us. So, gracious God, we gladly say, goodness is stronger than evil, love is stronger than hate. Because confusion can reign inside us despite our faith. Because anger, tension, bitterness, and envy distort our vision. Because our minds sometimes worry small things out of all proportion. Because we do not always get it right. We want to believe. Light is stronger than darkness. Truth is stronger than lies. 
because you have promised to hear us and are able to change us and are willing to make our hearts your home. We ask you to confront, control, forgive, and encourage us as you know best. And so we cherish in our hearts that which we proclaim with our lips. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Truth is stronger than lies. In these moments of silence, please add the prayers you are longing to express. Hear our prayer, Holy One, and change our lives until we illustrate the grace of the God who makes all things new. We pray this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us this week. Please join us next week for the first week of Lent. We are beginning a new Lenten worship series next week, and this series is called Good Enough, Facing the Imperfections of Life and Faith. You can catch a trailer for this next series on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page. I'm looking forward to it, but I know it's gonna be a challenge to accept the reality that I am indeed a created and beloved child of God, and who God created me to be is good enough. I don't know about you, but I found this discipleship series a real challenge, and it has led me to reconsider and reimagine the ways I live as a disciple in my community and in my world. And I know that we here at PUCC are also doing some reimagining and reconsidering about how we are connected with and engaged with our community as disciples. I hope that you are too, and I hope you will consider joining us in person sometime for worship. And let us accompany you on this journey of discipleship. So as we go forth this week into the world, my friends, may God be your haven and your glory. May Christ Jesus give you courage for his mission. And may the Holy Spirit hold your soul in the silence of God's embrace. We go forth in peace to love and to serve God. In the name of Christ, amen. Oh
my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me. Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you and you in